Well, tonight we are in chapter 5 and in chapter 6 of Daniel. And tonight uh, you can kind of let your hair down a little bit. This is uh, not as intense uh, with some of the kingdoms and so forth that we've been studying. Uh, Daniel chapter 6, no doubt, is very familiar to us. Uh, we were probably taught that if you grew up in church, you were taught that uh, in your Sunday school class. And so uh, tonight we'll be looking at chapter 5, uh, that's Belshazzar, that's the writing on the wall, and then chapter 6 is Daniel in the lion's den. So we're gearing up though, we're getting ready because we're about ready to launch into the uh, really uh, deeper parts and some of the more intriguing parts of Daniel where the prophecy is really front and center and we'll be looking at... Um, some tremendous, tremendous prophetic uh, passages uh, that will really, um, really have us studying. So I'm looking forward to that. Can't wait. Uh, and so next week we'll start to, to dip our foot in. And then we have one week break during our VBS here. And then the week after that, from there on out, there's five more weeks. And we'll be right into it in the thick of it. And it should be a lot of fun. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, before I start with a word of prayer here tonight, does anybody have any questions about anything here? Um, Housekeeping-wise, we've been making, I think we had 120 of the booklets made up, and I think, how many do we have left, Jeff? Are there any booklets back there? Zero? Okay, so, so there's zero. How many need one? You didn't get one? Okay, one or two? Okay, so we'll have to make up a few more um, for next time. Don't forget, you can pick up the videos that you've missed by going on YouTube. And uh, if you put in there, Faith Community Church, Gambrels, it'll pop right up. And so not only will you get uh, the Wednesday nights, you'll get Sunday morning, you'll get our intro uh, to the church. You get all kinds of stuff. So it's really, it's really pretty nice. See that? There you go. He wasn't even here last week, but he knows. See, that's what's the beauty of that. So we, we, we love that. That's just great. That's just great. Any questions uh, on anything up until this point? Somebody's calling in. We have a question calling in. <laughs> Hi, I'm in Abu Dhabi, and I was looking at this on YouTube. <laughs> I had a quick question. <laughs> All right, let's have a word of prayer, and uh, we'll dive into chapter 5 here um, this evening. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for the blessings that we have in studying your word. Uh, Lord, uh, Daniel, such an encouraging book to us as we, as we see uh, a stand for righteousness just rewarded over and over again. Uh, we see your fingerprints all over history uh, as you moved in the hearts of men to, to bring about the events and the significance of these events are just so well known to us um, uh, to this point. And yet, future Lord, we also recognize that there's a lot of things that are yet to happen. And Lord, there's no doubt that your fingerprints are all over the future too. And so we just have such peace, Lord, in knowing that you're in control and that we're, uh, we're on your side as, as followers of yours. And we're just so blessed to be um, a part of the body of Christ. So bless us, Lord, as we open your word tonight. Help us, Father, to, to glean your truth and be able to apply it, Lord. Um, we see significant passages of Scripture here tonight that will no doubt challenge us uh, in the area of Christian living, and that's always a, a huge blessing to us, Father. So we pray your blessing on uh, each heart tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, take your Bibles and go to Daniel chapter 5, and as you're going there, I just wanted to mention that at the end of chapter 4, that's when uh, we have basically the end of King Nebuchadnezzar. And King Nebuchadnezzar, as you know, was a general who was uh, promoted and eventually became king. He was uh, a substantial builder. Uh, he was able to accomplish a great deal. And it was, uh, it was fun to, to be able to study uh, him. He comes to the point in his life, though, where his pride is so great uh, that God takes him down uh, from that level of, of being proud and reduces him way down. Remember, he's the one who walks along and says, you know, this is the great Babylon that I've built. And the next thing you know, the judgment of God that had been prophesied 
with the vision of the great tree came true. And the next thing you know, he's acting like a, an ox. And he's out in a field, and he doesn't know what day it is, and his reason has left him. And the Bible said that that would happen for seven years. That was Daniel's instruction from God. And so at the end of the seven years, Nebuchadnezzar comes back around, and he acknowledges the true God of the Bible. And so we, we see that happening here with um, the Nebuchadnezzar. Now, there's a, a series of events that take place here, and you might, might want to just write down a couple of things here. Nebuchadnezzar went insane at about 562 B.C. And uh, after he came off of the scene, um, and I shouldn't say that. Let me just rephrase that. So he went insane sometime before 562 because 562 is actually his death. And you have following him, and the scriptures record the name as evil uh, Marduk, and I have it up here on the board behind me, uh, Amal Marduk. It, is, um, it was his pleasure to serve uh, as leadership there in Babylon from 562 to 560. So he follows Nebuchadnezzar. After uh, 560, uh, he's actually assassinated uh, by the next individual that's there on the list, uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, he is the one who assassinates him, and it's actually his brother-in-law. So obviously a little difficulty in the family. To say they didn't get along is probably an understatement, right? Um, Nereglisser uh, actually is responsible for bringing the Jews out of Israel, so if, or out of um, yeah, out of Israel with that captivity. He was there from 560 to 556. He actually plays a role, you may recall, in releasing Jeremiah from prison. Do you remember when Jeremiah was thrown in prison? This is uh, the king here uh, who uh, releases him 586. BC. Um, looking here at Labashi Marduk, he's the son of Nereglisser. He's the youngest son and he reigns only two months because he was assassinated. And he's assassinated by Nabonidus. Nabonidus is going to reign from 556 to 539. 556 to 5. 539. What happens in 539? Does anybody remember? It's when King Cyrus comes calling. 539. And it's over for the, the Babylonian Empire at that point in time. So um, important to, to note that. Nabonidus truly is the king of Babylon when we pick this up in chapter 5. In chapter 5 and in verse 1 it says, Belshazzar, the king held a great feast for a thousand of his nobles. And he was drinking wine in the presence of the thousand. Uh, you say, well, where does Belshazzar come from? Well, it's interesting if you, you know, dig around. Belshazzar's actually, uh, I'll say more about this a, a little later, but Belshazzar, we've really not heard anything about. In fact, there's very little record of Belshazzar. In history, we were not able to determine uh, this character, Belshazzar, at all until the 20th century uh, when an archaeologist came across Nabonidus' name and Belshazzar's name on the same cuneiform tablet. So it's amazing that the critics kept saying, well, see, the Bible's wrong. The Bible's wrong. There's no such thing as a, Bab uh, a Belshazzar in history. And yet you come down to it and you find out, oh, yes, there was. And, of course, they never apologized. Uh, you know, it, it just kind of you know, goes by the board. I always have such faith in the Word of God. You can't disprove it. Uh, if there's something we don't understand, it's our fault. And uh, maybe the information just hasn't been discovered or, or the, the form or whatever hasn't been made manifest yet. So it's an interesting um, reality. But Belshazzar is actually uh, here uh, is a son. He is a co-regent to Nabonidus. Nabonidus was one of these people who really didn't care for Babylon. He kind of liked the hanging gardens, as I understand it, but he really didn't care that much for the city. Nabonidus, um, you have the Nabonidus Chronicles, where we get a lot of this information from. And Nabonidus uh, actually did not show up at, uh, in Babylon for 14 years at one point. Can you imagine being the king? And that's your capital city, and you're not even there. 
So Belshazzar is the one who's actually making a lot of these decisions as time is going on, and that's why Belshazzar is the one here in our text. Belshazzar is having a party, and it's a big party. And uh, you'll notice there in your notes, if you go to Daniel, the fourth session, uh, that uh, he's having this, this, this huge party. Uh, and the Bible talks about some of the things that um, are happening here. It sounds like a, a grand festival. He has 1,000 people there. That's, a, that's an enormous number of people, isn't it? I mean, that's really, <laughs> that's really pretty enormous. Uh, and so they're having this great party. What's going on in the world when all of this is taking place? What's happening in the world? Well, the Medes and the Persians have risen to such power that they are approaching Babylon from the north. So they're heading south, coming down towards Babylon, and Nabonidus comes on the scene, and there's an enormous battle of Opus that takes place. Now, Opus is up on the Tigris-Euphrates River, and this enormous battle takes place, and the Medes and the Persians defeat the Babylonians at that battle of Opus. And after that, the Babylonians fled back to uh, a city that was just below it called Sipper, S-I-P-P-A-R in English. Uh, but they went down to Sippar, and it wasn't but a few days later uh, that uh, Cyrus the Great was able to go right into that city uh, they didn't have guns back there, but I'll tell you, they didn't even fire a shot, okay? Uh, they just walked right in, basically, and took that. The city surrendered. Just before that, Nabonidus splits. He takes off, and he goes back to his favorite town in Babylon, uh, ba the Babylonian Empire, and he gets out of there and leaves his son, Belshazzar, to be there in Babylon. And Belshazzar decides that he's going to get all the soldiers ready and prepare for this great battle. Is, is that right? No, that's not right. It's not right. Remember when Nebuchadnezzar was standing on the wall and he said, this is the great city that I've built? Do you remember, what did I say about the walls? Amazingly thick, double walls. Like they're like 25 feet thick. You have these double walls. It's basically, in their mind, impenetrable. The problem for them was that God was in control and God was moving to take this empire away from them. So this is the background to the story here in Daniel chapter 5. So let's go visit some of these events that are taking place here. We notice uh, Belshazzar's contempt. You'll see the contempt uh, for the Lord uh, and for the enemy. Most importantly here is the enemy... Uh, first off, because Belshazzar is having this great feast. I'm not sure if uh, he's having this great feast to build morale or not, uh, but the Bible says he brings his nobles. Some of your translations may say lords. It's the leading men. Uh, and this is a man who's known to have enormous feasts. According to one source, the king fed thousands of people every single day. There was a man by the name of Alexander who had a wedding there. He had 10,000 wedding guests. Can you imagine planning for 10,000 wedding guests? That's pretty intense. Well, here he is. He's there. This is taking place, if you want to write a little side note in, 30 years after Nebuchadnezzar's insanity. Daniel, at this point in time, is 81 years old. And Belshazzar is a good bit younger, about 60, 64, right in there. So Belshazzar has this great feast. And the Bible says he was drinking wine in the presence of the thousand. And so he's drinking this wine. He's actually setting the tone uh, for the party. This is going to be a raucous event. And in verse 2, Belshazzar, it says, tasted the wine. He tasted the wine. And when you read that, uh, tasted the wine, it really doesn't pop out to you very much. But in the Hebrew, it's fascinating because it's not so much tasting the flavor of it, more it's actually uh, the root um, stem in the Hebrew actually speaks of his intention was actually to become inebriated. Uh, he was drinking with the intention of becoming drunk. So I am not a drinker. I don't know what that seems like. But it's a big party. 
and he's drinking, and he just doesn't want to drink a couple drinks and then kick back and have some fellowship with his buddies. He's drinking, and he wants everyone to drink along with him, which was very important. That's why it says there that he drank in the presence of that thousand so that the thousand would see him drinking. You did basically what the king did if you wanted to have a happy life. Okay, You did what the king did. You remember Daniel and the three young men? They didn't eat the king's meat. They didn't eat the king's drink, drink the king's drink, and that angered the king. In fact, it was to the point where it could have cost them their life. And you may recall that that was a big test. Well, they came through that test, as you know, with supernatural help from God, and it was just an amazing uh, end of that story. But understand this. When the king says, I want you to do something, you did it. And so here's this king, and he's saying, here's what we're going to have. We're going to have a big-time party, and if I'm going to get drunk, you're going to get drunk too. And so all these nobles, these leading men, are drinking. Now, you'll find it interesting at this point that they're, they're drinking away, and he makes a strange decision. Notice there, verse 2. When he tasted the wine, he's getting drunk. He gave orders to bring the gold and the silver vessels, which Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple, which is in Jerusalem, so that the king and his nobles, his wives and concubines, might drink from them. Now, one little side note here that you might want to, um, that you might want to write down. When it mentions his father, uh, there are no words in the Hebrew to identify someone who's a grandson. There are actually seven different uses for the Hebrew word uh, besides father. There are 12 different words in the Hebrew for the word son, and it can be used in so many different applications. So he is a descendant of Nebuchadnezzar, probably on his mother's side, probably a grandson. And now what we're looking at is we're looking at him taking these pieces of precious metal as they were. Uh, these are, are goblets and so forth that were used especially in the temple for worship of Jehovah that Nebuchadnezzar had 50 years before taken out of Jerusalem when they exiled the people of Israel out, they brought this beautiful gold and silver, the plates, the chargers, the, the goblets, and so forth. They brought them all to Babylon. Remember these objects, because these are not just any objects. When they've been consecrated to God, they are pretty significant. And he is doing this um, for probably a couple of different reasons. Um, think it through. Why do you suppose, why do you suppose Belshazzar takes these precious metal objects that were used in temple worship and pulls them out for this great feast? What do you think his motivation was? Okay, contempt. Okay, all right. I'm not afraid of God, what'd you say? Yeah, I don't believe the prophecy, uh, you know, uh, contempt for Jehovah God. Uh, remember, the whole situation with Nebuchadnezzar, I mean, he really bowed his knee to God. I mean, there was no question about that. I mean, you're walking around as an ox eating grass, and your fingernails are five inches long, and all of a sudden you come to your senses, and all the people know about it. That's pretty heavy stuff. And so here is this Belshazzar who's thinking to himself, you know, I'm not going to bow my knee to this Jehovah God. I don't know what happened to Nebuchadnezzar, but, you know, this isn't going to happen to me. And he has a great deal of contempt. And he does want to show off. This is a huge party. And these objects are brilliant in color and so forth, and they would really, really look great on my table. And so he gathers them up, and he brings them out. And how fascinating um, it probably was here when we, when we stop and, and we think it through. And so here he is, um, this descendant of Nebuchadnezzar, who is, who is willing to do uh, something that probably Nebuchadnezzar uh, would not have done himself. So the Bible says that uh, these were the nobles he was drinking with. He brings out the gold and silver vessels, which his father had taken out of the temple. 
so that the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. And the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines drank from them. They drank the wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Now that's not a really good idea. It is a, it is a poor idea to do that. I want you to know that as we go through chapter 5, and even as we go through chapter 6, I find that there are a lot of things that are bleeding through from a chapter like this that will carry significance forward. So stay with me for just a second, and I'll try to explain this. When I'm looking at the totality of Daniel, and I'm understanding that we're in chapter 5, but I'm thinking already of chapter 11 and chapter 12, I'm thinking through how God feels about an event like this. I'm thinking through and I'm saying, wow, God is really, really not pleased with the desecration of these items. And, and I really believe that it carries through because later on when you come back on through, um, going all the way back to, to Daniel chapter 9, uh, you know, you flip back there, in Daniel chapter 9 in the 70 weeks, it talks about the uh, time where the Antichrist will come into Jerusalem and he is going to uh, be defiling uh, the temple that is there. Um, and uh, these desolations are going to take place. On the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even a complete destruction. One that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. Uh, the abomination of desolations is going to take place uh, by the person of Antiochus Epiphanes. Uh, we know Antiochus comes and, and he does uh, terrible things in the temple. And then later on, it is duplicated again, uh, only worse by the Antichrist. And when you think of how God's anger is building up at this point in chapter 5 because of Belshazzar's actions, you can only imagine how angry God is at the Antichrist who is doing that in the temple. This is a temple that hasn't been built yet, folks. Uh, it's coming. They're already assembling all the pieces to it. It's ready to go. It really is. Um, and once that temple is built, uh, they will begin to worship there, but only for a short period of time. And then the Antichrist will step into the midst of it. And it is God who is totally justified in coming himself. And that's what's so amazing. Now, stop and think with me. We talked about those four kingdoms. And we talked about the four smiths or the four craftsmen. How, remember, how many remember the four craftsmen in Zechariah? We looked at them. Remember, the, the one kingdom comes and it smashes the, the first kingdom. So you have Babylon starting off. And then you have the Medes and the Persians smiting them. And then who smites the Medes and the Persians? The Greeks. That's right. And who smashes the Greeks? Antiochus Epiphany gets smashed by Rome. And who smashes Rome in that final chapter? Jesus Christ comes back and he brings judgment. And so... Don't miss that. I, I, I'm looking at this and I'm saying, wow, here we are in Daniel chapter 5, and God doesn't waste any time in dealing with this type of, of desecration. He's not, uh, he's not pleased with this at all. So here you see Belshazzar's consternation with this handwriting on the wall. Verse 5, suddenly the fingers of a man's hand emerged and began writing opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the back of the hand that did the writing. And the king's face grew pale, and his thoughts alarmed him. And his hips, his hip joints went slack, and his knees began knocking together. And the king called aloud to bring in the conjurers, the Chaldeans, and the diviners. And the king spoke and said to the wise men of Babylon, Any man who can read this inscription, explain its interpretation to me, shall be clothed with purple, have a necklace of gold around his neck, and have the authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. So remember, he was the second ruler. So he's saying, hey, I'm, I'm going to make you, you know, right behind me as far as uh, the big stuff. You're going to get the big moose hat. All you're going to do is come in here and interpret this for me. And so all the king's wise men came in. They couldn't read the inscription or make known its interpretation to the king. 
And King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed. His face grew even paler. And I'd like to put in there that I bet you his joints were going even a little worse <laughs> at that point. His knees were really knocking now. And his nobles were perplexed. Fascinating description here of what takes place where a man's fingers, uh, the fingers of a man's hand, emerge and start writing. And it's, he's writing on the opposite of the lampstand. So evidently, uh, God chose an area that would be pretty well lit up. Now, here's the cool thing. So God's word says that the wall was made out of plaster. That's kind of cool. You say, well, that's just a minor detail, right? I mean, it's, it's no big deal. Coldaway, that, uh, that's his last name, K-O-L-D-E-W-A-Y, um, this archaeologist discovered as he began to unearth uh, Babylon, he unearthed a room that was 55 by 169 feet. And he found this little area there where the king would be. And you'll never guess what the walls were made out of there. Plaster. Isn't that cool? In a little detail. But there it is. God says, here it is, it's plaster. And do you think God knew that Coldway was going to discover it someday? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Preserved it, Preserved it right there. He could do it. And so here's this king. The Bible says that the king uh, couldn't miss it because there it is by this lampstand. It's well lit. And everything changed for the king. So he, at this point, is having this, this drunken feast. I won't even go into probably some of the stuff that they're doing, but I'm sure it's filled with immorality to beat the band. Uh, they're all drunk, and all of a sudden, this sobered them up pretty quick. And the Bible says that his, his color changed. That's what it means when it says that he got pale. Literally, to lose color is the idea here. And the word joints there is actually uh, a word that means knots, to knot up. Okay, it's almost like his body began to knot up, like he had these massive cramps uh, because he was under such stress and strain over this whole scenario. And he is just absolutely freaking out. Now, he asked these people to come, and the Bible says when these guys, the wise guys, uh, came, they couldn't figure it out. They've got a great track record, don't they? They really do. I think they should have been ripped limb from limb back when Nebuchadnezzar said that's what he was going to do to them, right? Um, but no, Daniel was merciful, so there, there they are, back in the picture. You'll notice one thing that stands out, at least it stood out to me. Do you see what's missing there? You have all these uh, conjurers and Chaldeans and so forth. What's the one group that's missing? The magicians, right? Who's, who's the head of the magicians? Daniel. <laughs> he didn't want Daniel. It's like, nah, I don't want Daniel. I just bring these other guys. And it's interesting, too, that when they show up and they can't do the interpretation that what ends up happening is he, it's almost like he's starting to relax a little bit. His color's coming back, and these guys come in like he's going to get some kind of an answer, and it perplexes him even greater because they can't answer it. They can't figure it out. And uh, so now he's even in worse shape. The knots are even tighter. The knees are knocking harder. There's even more color gone from his face. He is just really in a world of, of, of hurt. And so this is a difficult time for him. And enter now, verse 10, the queen. This is the king's, uh, you know, the, the, the future, the failure once again uh, of the wise men leads to the queen coming in in verse 10. She enters the banquet hall because of the words of the king and his nobles. And the queen spoke and said, O king, live forever. That's the typical greeting. And she says, um, there's a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And in the days of your father, illumination, insight, and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, appointed him chief of the magicians, conjurers, Chaldeans, and diviners. This was because an extraordinary spirit, knowledge and insight, interpretation of dreams, explanation of enigmas. I like that one. I have an enigma. Could you explain it? And solving of difficult problems were found in this Daniel. He could have tutored me during uh, algebra class. <laughs> Whom the king named Belteshazzar. Uh, let Daniel now be summoned, and he will declare the interpretation. And so here's the queen mother. She comes in. Um, it's interesting here. I, I know uh, my seminary professor uh, believed that this, um, this person was, and I, I, I'll spell her name, a-M-Y-T-I-S. And 
she was the widow of Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, quite possibly. The other person she might be able to, to be, but it doesn't seem likely, would be the wife of Nabonidus. Maybe staying in there in Babylon. But I don't know why he would flee from the uh, Medes and Persians and leave his wife there in Babylon, unless they really weren't getting along. <laughs> she came in, and she evidently seems to, to really know so much information. And she's able to point to Daniel. One thing here that really is, um, is interesting, too, is the fact that she mentions Daniel by name, and he, she uses his Hebrew name. Do you see that there? She also referenced him in his Babylonian name, but a couple times there, it's Daniel. It's Daniel. And I think that there's a, a pretty significant uh, reason for that. It's very likely that after what happened to Nebuchadnezzar, uh, that she actually put her faith in Jehovah and uh, is a believer. And I, I think that that's a, a very strong possibility. I can't obviously answer that uh, for certain, uh, but it would, would seem that way as she comes in. So she leads to this last resort, who is Daniel. So Daniel's brought in before the king, and the king spoke and said to Daniel, are you that Daniel? How many Daniels are there? Come on now. Who's one of the exiles from Judah, who my father the king brought from Judah? Now I've heard about you, that a spirit of the gods is in you, and that illumination, insight, and extraordinary wisdom. He goes on and he praises him. And uh, he says, I personally, verse 16, have heard you're able to give interpretations. Um, and he says, now, if you're able to read the inscription and make its interpretation known, you'll be clothed with purple, wear a necklace of gold. You'll have authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. And Daniel answered and said before the king, keep your gifts for yourself or give your rewards to someone else. However, I will read the inscription to the king and make it known to him. Before Daniel does that, however, Daniel is going to rebuke the king for his pride. Now, there's a lot of backbone that's taken place here in order to do this. Because you'll see here that after he tells him to keep his gifts, he says in verse 18, O king, most high God has granted sovereignty, grandeur, glory, and majesty to Nebuchadnezzar your father. Because of the grandeur which he bestowed on him, all peoples, nations, men of every language feared and trembled before him. Whomever he wished, he killed, and whoever he wished to spare, he spared. He's elevated, and whoever he wished, he humbled. But when his heart was lifted up, when his spirit became so proud, he behaved arrogantly. He was deposed from his royal throne, and his glory was taken away from him. He was also driven away from mankind. His heart was made like that of beasts, and his dwelling place was with the wild donkeys. He was given grass to eat like cattle. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he recognized the Most High God, his ruler over the realm of mankind, and he sets over it whomever he wishes. Yet you, his son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, even though you knew all this. So even though he may have not personally understood it and experienced it, he certainly knew about it and should have guarded against a proud heart himself. He says, you've exalted yourself against the Lord of heaven, and you've brought the vessels of his house before you, and your nobles, your wives, your concubines have been drinking wine from them. And you're praising the gods of silver and gold, bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which don't see or hear or understand. But the God in whose hand are your life breath, and all your ways you've not glorified. And then the hand was sent from him, and this inscription was written out. There's a couple of things. Can you imagine when Daniel wrote, walked into that place? Daniel summoned to go in, and there's Daniel when he walked in. Can you imagine how Daniel's eyes must have gotten big when he noticed the furnishings from the temple were there, and that people who were not consecrated to even handle those things were grabbing them and becoming drunken by drinking them out of them? I mean, that must have been disheartening to him, uh, and certainly he brings it to the king's attention. It did not escape Daniel that those items were there, and Daniel makes it very, very clear that, that they are doing this in a defiant way to God, but there was going to be some accountability because it is God, he reminds him, who gives him breath. How often we should be reminded of that, huh? Get up in the morning, it's God who's given us the breath. Uh, God, God, 
We don't do anything unless God says, keep going, right? I mean, he can pull that back, take it off the table anytime he wants. He can call us home. But here's this man who is so full of pride uh, that he's not willing to acknowledge uh, God in any way at all. You know, uh, when you think of that desecration and, and you think of the evil kingdoms that are judged, you're just so reminded that God is holy and he will not be mocked. And Galatians is going to tell us that later on in the New Testament. For whatsoever you know, a man sows, that will he also reap. And so this is what's going to happen. Daniel looks in verse 25, and he looks at the inscription that's there on the wall. Now this is the inscription, Mene, Mene, Teko, Up, Harsin. This is the interpretation of your message. And so the first, the first Hebrew or Aramaic is going to be, it's a, it's a participle that, that means to number or to reckon. Uh, the wise men and so forth should have been able to understand that aspect. What they couldn't have understood was the second part that he mentions there. He says uh, that this means God has numbered your kingdom and put an end to it. That's what the wise guys would not have known. Uh, they could have come up to the answer and said, well, here's what this word means, but they didn't even do that. So, so Daniel takes it to the next step, and he says, listen, this is all about reckoning. And when we think of reckoning, we would better understand it maybe as calculating. Uh, this has been calculated out. And the numbers of your days, and specifically of your kingdom, they're running out. In fact, they've run out. There's no more. And so this is pretty, pretty amazing um, when he interprets this for the king. The second word there is also a participle, which means to, to weigh something out. And literally, it means to be found light, to be found light. Uh, if you had a balance, it was always important that the balance, uh, remember the proverbial scale, right? I don't know what a scale looks like, but there's the base, and that's really important. <laughs> Naturally, a, a scale does not sit perfectly. It just really doesn't do that. Um, in, our, in the former churches that I've been in, we always had VBS and we had a penny parade. And the boys were against the girls. And we, we give the money to missions. It was hilarious. When we first started doing it, we had these tiny little buckets. They were like this big. And, and the kids would bring so much stuff and they just dump these pennies in, and then the parents started getting into it. And so we started to run it like it was a bank. We'd take the rolls of pennies out from the Monday night, and then Tuesday night when they'd show up, the parents would go in there, give, you know, like $10, and they'd get $10 worth of pennies, give them to their kids. And I mean, it was, it was a big, big deal. And it eventually got to the point where we had to build bigger and bigger scales. We finally ended up with five-gallon buckets. And if you can imagine, I can remember the Lord always worked it out perfectly so that two nights the girls would win, two nights the guys would win. And then on Friday night, it was the big finale. And it would always overflow the five-gallon bucket. Do you know how many pennies are in a five-gallon bucket? Seriously, we, we would give a, almost $1,000 some years to missions of just pennies. It was crazy. And sometimes a kid would throw a slug in there, and I'd find it, you know. I remember this kid put this big ball bearing in. <laughs> First thing I did was find out whether or not it was my son. That's the first thing. I want to find, okay, Dave, all right. So, so and it was like, you know, the FBI. So it wasn't you? Okay, I'm, I'm thankful for that. Now tell me who did it. Well, I can't tell you who did it, Dad. It's like, then you know who did it. Okay. So I knew the rascal in the bunch. I was able to track him down. Um, I still have that ball berry. It was, it was, those were fun times. They really were. But the point is, we always had to start by putting a few pennies into whatever bucket was a little higher so that you always started at neutral. You always had to have it even. And so we would make sure that that was the case. And with weights and measures, you actually had people who would go around and make certain that these, these weights and measures were, were correct because you remember in the Old Testament, God, one of the things he condemns is how they've manipulated the weights and measures and uh, the justice is not in the streets, as God would say. And so it was a huge, a huge problem. So when you look at this second word that is written there behind him, uh, Daniel is pointing out that you've been weighed and you're coming up light. You're coming up light. 
This was actually a term that was oftentimes associated with morality and whether or not you were truly living like you should live. You see, it had a spiritual component to it. He wasn't talking about money. He was saying that basically um, you're spiritually, you're morally and spiritually, you're out of sync. You're, you've been found to be too light in the area of righteousness, and God is going to judge you for that reason. The third word there is to be broken. And he says here, you've been weighed in the scales, found deficient. Peres, the next one, your kingdom has been divided and given over to the Medes and the Persians. Um, that word Paris means to be broken or divided. Does anybody see anything interesting there with that last word? Yeah. The, the, the consonants are, the, the, hard, the hard letters are the same as Persia. It's almost like there's a play on words that are going on here. It's like, yeah, your, your kingdom is going to be smashed, but it's going to be divided, and it'll be the Medes and the Persians that uh, are, are going to come and ultimately bring this judgment uh, upon you. So Belshazzar, he's looking for some compensation for this evil here. He's going to give orders in verse 29. Uh, you know, like, thank you very much, Daniel. Bel you know, Belshazzar's happy. Um, he clothed Daniel with purple and put a necklace of gold and issued a proclamation concerning him that he had authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. And the Bible says there in verse 30 that the end of Babylon takes place. 539 B.C., that same night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was slain. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom at about the age of 62. 62. Well, interesting. How in the world does a kingdom with that type of fortification and such enormous walls fall just like that to the Medes? Well, it was interesting. They had a plan. Medes and Persians, so Cyrus the Great came down there upon Babylon and he had looked at the walls and thought to himself, no doubt we're not going to get through that 25-foot wall that's like 40 feet high, and if we ever got over that, what would we do once we got inside? You know, and this isn't going to be that easy. And so they were able to divert the river that flowed through the city, and then on the bed, the riverbed, once they diverted the water away, they were able to go right in underneath uh, that bridge because there was clearance enough for them to go right in and uh, take the city. And so there's Belshazzar, and, and you're done. You're done, man. You're done. And so it was over for him, and that is the end of this kingdom. And this is that, that first smith. The first smith is the Medes and the Persians. They're the ones that come with a hammer, and they hammer down uh, that first empire where the head is of gold, this great empire uh, known as Babylon, Babylon, the great. And so Babylon wasn't uh, ultimately destroyed. We, we know that uh, as we read uh, some of the literature uh, around this, uh, that they didn't destroy Babylon. Uh, they lived there. Uh, actually, uh, one of the historians, Herodotus, uh, writes that they lived there for hundreds of years. In fact, Cyrus the Great, I read somewhere, was actually very impressed with the Hanging Gardens and uh, was interested in maintaining uh, some of that as well. So now you have uh, a brand new individual. You have Darius the Mede who is on the scene. He's the new monarch. Uh, he's 19 years younger uh, than uh, Daniel is. And uh, he's an interesting character. And he's one that, that bears study in trying to identify him. And I want to just uh, read from uh, a commentary here on Daniel. The identity of the Medo-Persian ruler in the story, Darius the Mede, has long been questioned. No one of this name is known from secular history, and it's well established that Cyrus, who captured Babylon, continued as ruler over the empire until 530, 529 B.C. So roughly 10 years, uh, Cyrus the Great will continue. So nine years after Babylon's fall. There's three views that are represented among scholars. One, that this man was Cyrus himself under a different name. Another is that he was Cambyses, the son of Cyrus, who served under his father as ruler over Babylon and later succeeded him as emperor. 
That's uh, favored by some. And then the third is that it was Gubaru. You can write that name down. G-U-B-A-R-U, appointed governor over Babylon by Cyrus immediately after the fall of the city. You may have heard of John Wickham. John Wickham uh, favors that view. And of the three, that last view finds uh, most in its favor. So it is most likely that Gubaru is the person there who's a, appointed governor uh, over Babylon. So King Cyrus would be uh, the number one uh, king, and then this person would be number two. Now, when this all takes place, uh, there's some fascinating reasons for all of this to happen. Uh, because chapter 6 and verse 1 it seemed good to Darius to appoint 120 satraps over the kingdom that they would be in charge of the whole kingdom. So you have these um, actually 20 territories and they're going to be ruled by 120 satraps or individuals. And some of those satraps may only be actually presiding over one particular town. There's three who are presidents the word presidents means chief or leader. There's three of them, and guess what? Daniel's one of them, of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might be accountable to them and that the king might not suffer loss. Now, that's pretty impressive, isn't it? 120 satraps over 20, I, don't, I think they call them satrapies, but I'm not sure. I, I think that's what it is, the satrapies, and these 120 are all ruling. And when they'd get in a problem and they'd have a jam, they would go to one of those three presidents, those three chiefs, and there's Daniel, and he's one of the chiefs. Now, isn't it amazing how God works all those things out? Isn't it? Daniel's in his 80s. Anybody here in your 80s? Nobody's going to raise their hand, including Joe. When you're in your 80s, you're just getting started. You're just getting started. That's when God says, okay, uh, we've, had enough, we've had enough communication and we've had enough plans and we've been getting a lot done. We've got some serious business to get down to. When you think of Daniel, uh, you're going to think of him largely because of chapter 6. And he has lived his entire life following the Lord so that he might be able to be so used by Almighty God. So if you think you're going to retire when you're 65 years old, God's going to stop using you, uh, you need to read Daniel uh, from a different perspective and realize that if God's given you the breath, like remember King Belshazzar forgot about, if God gives you breath to get up in the morning and you can get out of bed, you go ahead and serve the Lord. And that's all that Daniel wants to focus on. I just find it refreshing to see Daniel uh, as one of these three presidents or one of these three chiefs um, at this point in his life. Uh, I, think it's, I think it's absolutely fantastic. So something incredible is going to happen right here. Because when you think of Daniel chapter 6, you think of lions. But don't think of lions quite yet. <laughs> Verse 3, Daniel began distinguishing himself among the commissioners and the satraps. How many satraps are there? 120. He's distinguishing himself. There is a, that's a participle, the, the absolute neatest, began distinguishing. It is continual action. He is continually distinguishing himself. He is being set apart from the others because he possessed an extraordinary spirit and the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom. Wow. Is that pretty neat? I mean, that's, that's, pretty exciting to me. I'm looking at Daniel and I'm saying, wow, Daniel, you know, how terrible it was that you were exiled uh, away from your homeland in Jerusalem. Uh, you went to this faraway place where it was just horrifying. And, and Babylon was, was a, a, a nasty kingdom. I mean, it was, it was a brutal kingdom. And now here you are, and, and you're probably thinking to yourself if you're 80 some years old, right? You're thinking to yourself, okay, can I just relax and die already? I mean, you know, I mean, I'm not saying like right now today. I'm saying like, like down the road, can I just have peace and tranquility? I mean, you know, seriously, can't this Belshazzar guy just chill out and quit doing this stuff 
and, you know, I'll just keep praying for Jerusalem. And yet God says, okay, wait a minute. I'm not going to do that. I'm bringing in Cyrus the Great while you are in your 80s, Daniel, and you are going to witness this. I'm sure there was a measure of, of angst in Daniel's heart to know that the kingdom that he lived in was about ready to be taken over. How would we feel if America was about ready to fall to a foreign nation? Would it freak you out? It would freak you out. It would freak you out. And uh, there was hardly any loss of life. Uh, the, the writings go on to say that uh, when they actually went into the king, the, the king had managed to pull his knife out, but he was totally fried. And uh, there wasn't much of a fight. That was the end of him. And uh, that was it. He, he, they killed him. But Daniel didn't die. Uh, da God had his hand on Daniel. And Daniel's actually rising now through the ranks. And the interesting thing here is that Darius seems to be much more impressed with Daniel and Daniel's God than Belshazzar ever was. Belshazzar had total contempt for God. And so it was all God's plan. So it's interesting, the companies changed hands, as it were. Uh, but from Daniel's perspective, he's got to be pretty happy with the new regime. This is pretty exciting. Notice what goes on here. The commissioners and the satraps aren't too happy about what's happening. And they're going to come after Daniel. But before this happens, folks, there's something that really is really cool that happens. And it's not in Daniel. So you've got to take your Bible and go back and dig up Ezra. Put my ribbony thing there. Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job. Job's pretty much in the middle, so you can just go back from there. Ezra. And you don't have to go far once you find Ezra. Just find Ezra chapter 1. God's lifting up a kingdom. Medes and the Persians are gaining strength. They come in, they take over this, this knucklehead Belshazzar. And this is what happens in Ezra chapter 1 and in verse 1. It says in the first year, in the first year, so it's one of the first things that Cyrus, the king of Persia, does is he orders to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing saying, thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven. You see what kind of terminology he's using. He's using good Hebrew here. He's given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He's appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. I find that fascinating, don't you? His acknowledgement of Jehovah God and his recognition of Jehovah God is the exact antithesis of Belshazzar. And he says, whoever there is among you of all his people, may his God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. Now, it is it's something that we understand. Israel went back into the land uh, this last time. In what year was it? 1948. Uh, he went, they went back into the land. Uh, that was a big deal. And they're going back now. They've been exiled. They've been scattered. But if you go back and you study Ezra and Nehemiah, you see how God begins to rebuild everything uh, back there during this time period. This would never have happened if Cyrus had not come along. So even though there was some, some consternation, no doubt, on the part of Daniel and, and the Jews there, because there's a lot of uncertainty, God was in control. He has that steering wheel. And it's God who has sent that, that nation to smite this other nation and put in the heart of the king the desire to bring the people of Israel back. You want to see something that's kind of cool? Look at this. I get excited about this. This is, this is just great. He says here uh, that every survivor at whatever place he may live, let the men of that place support him with silver and gold, goods and cattle, together with a free will offering for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. Whew, they're going to take an offering up. And uh, that's going to be enough to, to start getting things going. But we're not done yet. Here's the next part. The heads of the fathers 
households of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests and the Levites arose, even every one whose spirit God had stirred to go up and rebuild the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. All those about them encouraged them with articles of silver gold goods, with cattle and with valuables, aside from all that was given as a freewill offering. So King Cyrus brought out the articles. Get this, verse 7. I have it highlighted in my Bible. King Cyrus brought out the articles of the house of the Lord that Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem. And let me just put my own little quip in there. And Belshazzar desecrated, okay? These are the very things old Belshazzar was drinking out of. They're going back to Israel. They're going back, and then they're going to be prepared for that day when the worship is restored. And the Bible says, he put in the house of his gods, and Cyrus, king of Persia, had them brought out by the hand of Mithridath, the treasurer, and he counted them out to Sheshbazzar, the prince of Judah. And he gives all of the number. There were 30 dishes and 1,000 silver, 30 gold, and there's duplicates, and there's golden bowls, and all the articles of the gold and silver numbered 5,400. Do you think God keeps track of his stuff? There's 5,400. And all 5,400 are going right back. Uh, God was not happy that that desecration had taken place. And God has moved in an uh, unbeliever at first glance, his heart. I'm not sure Cyrus is an unbeliever uh, as I'm looking at this. It seems he has an affinity for uh, certainly the God of Israel. So this is pretty, um, pretty exciting. Let's flip back over there to Daniel chapter 6. Because while all of these wonderful things are going on, and you know that Daniel, being so highly ranked in the kingdom, has had a profound impact on Darius. He's got a profound impact on Darius, who's had a profound impact on Cyrus the Great. Cyrus the Great's at the top, then you have Darius, and down, down below him, you have Daniel. And so this has all been uh, pushing up from Daniel. And it's exciting, but there's a price to pay. Not everybody's excited about this. You see, when God's people follow God's leading, uh, great things happen. Uh, but in addition to great things happening, there's also challenges by the adversary. Because the adversary, Satan, never sits still, does he? He never takes any time off. He's always battling. And so Daniel is going to be called upon here because he is going to pay uh, what they think will be the ultimate price. And you'll note here, uh, the commissioners and satraps began trying to find a ground of accusation against Daniel in regard to government affairs, but they could find no ground of accusation or evidence of corruption inasmuch as he was faithful and there was no negligence or corruption found in him. And the men said, we'll not find any ground of accusation against this Daniel unless we find it against him with regard to the law of his God. He is a law-abiding individual. He is a good citizen. He is honest. He's not corrupt. Um, he's just like politicians today in America. And, I mean, there's, there's no skeletons in anybody's claw. I mean, you know, Daniel is really, character-wise, what every single one of us as believers should model after. We are modeling after Christ. He is a great example of living out his faith in a Christ-like manner. And he is worthy of, of our attention. He really, really is. And so as these men looked at his life, they were looking for anything that they could possibly find that could be used to discredit him. Now you can't turn on the news today without finding all types of serious accusations being leveled at our presidential candidate. And, and most of them are true, I think. It's like... <laughs> I mean, it's just like, this is, this is so inspiring. I have to tell you, this, this cracked me up. Uh, it, it, well, it didn't crack me up, but this is just, this is how bad it's gotten in our country. So uh, Steve and I were going for lunch the, the last week, and um, we're walking across the parking lot, and I see this sticker on the back of this guy's truck, and I can tell it's a political sticker. I can, I can see, you know, it's that blue color, you know, and so I thought, well, it's either, you know, a 10-year-old Obama sticker or... Um, you know, I don't know why people don't take those Obama stickers and, and Bush stickers and stuff off their cars after like 400 years. Um, I don't understand that. It's like, it's like it holds the car together. Yeah, that and some duct tape, right? So, so I walk up there and I'm trying to figure out which person this is a person who's voting for. And it just says, giant meteorite. 
<laughs> End it all, 2016. <laughs> I thought, that is really sad that our country has gotten to that point, right? I mean, but it's, it's so disheartening. You, you look at all of the people today that are supposed to be the leaders, um, and where is the character? Where are people like Daniel who, if the world takes a microscope and looks at them so, 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 so carefully, they find absolutely nothing. Daniel has lived there for how many years? 60-some years. Okay, if there's dirt, you'll find it there. And there's no one to say anything negative about Daniel. The only thing they can come up with is, well, you know, the God he follows, kind of strange there, some of the things he does. And they pick out, namely, his prayer life. And they focus on his prayer life. And in their demonic thought process, they come up with a law that would prohibit him from doing this. Verse 6, these are the commissions of satraps that came to agreement. And they said, King Darius lived forever. All the commissioners of the kingdom, the prefects and satraps, high officials, and the governors have consulted together. Uh, the king should establish a statute and enforce an injunction that anyone who makes a petition to any god or man besides you, O king, for 30 days shall be cast in the lion's den. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so, we might not, so it may not be changed. According to the law, here's an important point, according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which may not be revoked. And he signed this document. And so this conspiracy that has gone forth... Um, there's no pretext of, of error or neglect. And so they, they come and they, they've accused him uh, basically of, of this prayer. And what they're supposed to be doing is saying, well, King, listen, for 30 days, uh, no one can worship or pray to any other God except to you. And uh, the reason why I'm not sure Darius is a believer is because he's willing to accept that worship. You remember when people came and then wanted to worship you know, Peter, he said, forget it, get up. You know, you're not going to be able to worship me. And here he is, he's being worshipped. Daniel, the Bible says in the next verse, knew about this decision and knew that the king had signed this law. Now here's your dilemma. Put yourself in Daniel's shoes tonight, okay? Put yourself right there in Daniel's shoes. You pray as you've always prayed. And they're going to throw you into a den full of lions. And the lions are going to rip you into small pieces and fully eat you. Where does your brain go? What are some of your choices? What are, what are your options at that point? You ever go to a restaurant and you think to yourself, oh, people are probably watching me. Should I pray out loud for my food or should I just pray silently? I find it fascinating even a little before that because I have a hard time believing that all these guys got together, made this arrangement, and Daniel didn't know about it, but he never tried to interfere. Right. I think that's how great his mm -hmm. faith in God was. That mm -hmm. God, if you allow this to pass, yep. you're going to take care of it. Yep. So, so when Daniel is sitting there, one of the options he might think about is, you know, it's only for 30 days. 30 days. You know. I mean, what if somebody said to you, "Listen, we're going to throw you in a pit of lions, and you're going to be ripped to shreds and eaten." Don't forget that part. Yeah. If you go to church in the month of July, you can start back to church in August. And you can go for the rest of the year. We won't bother you. But you can't go for 30 days. You'd be like, well, you know, they got a golf tournament the second weekend. And I was thinking of going to the beach anything, you know, for two weeks. And, you know, my mother needs a little visit. And, yeah, you know what? I won't say that I'm not going to. But seriously, when we're put to the test, what would we do? What would we do? How great is, is our faith? Um, you know, th these challenges that Daniel is going through, um, are going to be more valuable to us in our study because of the direction that the world is going. And the pressure that's going to, in my opinion, be brought upon the church in America is something that we've never faced 
before, but I can't see how it's not going to occur here because it's occurred all around the world for literally thousands of years. And we've been immune. We've been just happy campers rolling along in what we'll celebrate this weekend is our freedom. But our freedoms are being taken away. Now I'm on my soapbox, so sorry. <laughs> our freedoms are being taken away. In fact, it's gotten to the point that if you look at, at what is very likely to happen in the progression, you, you see things that are happening, for instance, in Europe and in Canada, and they only take a little bit of time to follow here as well. For instance, much of our liberty is, is attributable to Supreme Court decisions today. The Supreme Court, as you know, is locked sometimes uh, between conservative and more liberal justices. And we have very political justices now that are involved. You could have a decision that comes down very shortly that says, if you have these certain beliefs, you're not allowed to worship. What they've done in different places, and I think the first thing that would happen is that they would take away our tax-exempt status. Um, I, I think that that will happen fairly soon, actually, um, within five, ten years. I think that after that, you will see um, a decision that will have to be made as to whether or not you're going to continue to teach the whole Bible or you're going to eliminate certain parts of it and only preach certain parts. And that will divide a lot of believers because that is a, a real thorny issue. And, it, and the reason I say that is just coming to it from a historical perspective, having seen this take place, we don't have to go very far to be able to see it taking place in countries all over the world, whether they're African countries, on and on and on. You either become a state-run church, basically in agreement with these things, or you go underground as the church. And you can never stomp the church out. Uh, the church of Jesus Christ cannot be prevailed upon. Uh, even the gates of hell cannot um, stop it. Jesus' gospel will continue to go forward, and people will continue to be saved. But the church on the surface could look much, much different. And what would we do if we were pressed with these types of difficult decisions? Uh, I think Daniel, like I say, will become a very dear book of study because we will look to Daniel and we will look to his faith and his willingness to follow the Lord through deep water um, as we face decisions that are going to impact us as well. Now, I know that many of you here are dealing with decisions that you're making that are impacting your life in real time, and it's, 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 it's very real for you, and you're seeing it already. Uh, I talk to people all the time who are finding that their, their freedom to live out their Christianity and their workplace and so forth is being compromised greatly. And it, it's of, of pretty serious concern. So we have to be prepared. You know, uh, probably in our next hymn sing, somebody will pick Dare to Be a Daniel, right? We'll be singing that song. So Daniel's going to get thrown in a lion's den if he keeps praying. But what are you going to do? Are you going to keep praying or are you going to, to pray silently or... You know, at least turn out your lamp, go to bed, lay on your bed and pray there. I mean, you know, uh, what are you going to do? Well, what Daniel does is in keeping with his faith, uh, he entered his house uh, on his roof chamber. He had windows open towards Jerusalem, which was the custom in Babylon, especially during the warm months. And he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God as he had been doing previously. And the men came by agreement, found Daniel making petition and supplication before his God. And then they approached and spoke before the king about the king's injunction. Did you not sign an injunction that any man who makes a petition to any god or man besides you, O king, for 30 days to be cast in the lion's den? And you know what the answer is going to be. So there is Daniel, willing to go and pray. This was a huge issue, by the way, just going back into church history, for people who would recant their faith. Uh, during the time of the Reformation, people were being who people who believed in being baptized by immersion uh, were being killed in very very large numbers. Um, the Lutherans had an army, the Catholics had an army, and they were fighting together. And then you had these other groups in the middle who were rebaptizing, and that, that's why they got the name Anabaptist uh, because they were rebaptizing. And they discovered that a great way to get rid of these people, if they wouldn't recant their faith, 
was to put him in a chair on the end of a log and swing the log into the river and dip him in the river or the lake and drown them. They wanted to be immersed, we'll immerse you. And that's how they killed thousands upon thousands. Read Fox's Book of Martyrs, it's filled um, with those stories. And here's the problem. In the church, one of the sticky issues were people came to you and said, are you a follower of Jesus Christ? And you know that if you say yes, they're going to take you and stick you in the river. And so you say, well, well, not exactly. And you sign a piece of paper or whatever, and you walk away. Later on, you come back to your church, and you're repentant. And the church was, was internally having great strife and, and, frankly, arguments over what to do with these people who had recanted their faith and now were coming back in desiring fellowship. Interesting, huh? I mean, these types of things have, have happened. Daniel does not waver. Daniel comes out and he takes his stand before the Lord. And the Bible says that the king is held to his word because of the law of the Medes and the Persians. And uh, notice verse 14. As soon as the king heard this statement, he was deeply distressed. That was not the reaction that the satraps and the leaders desired when they made this all up. What they were looking for was an angry king. They wanted him to be angry with Daniel, that Daniel had done this. But his emotional response is that he's deeply distressed because he knows he can't deliver Daniel. And this is a very difficult thing for him. And so even until sunset, he kept exerting himself to try to rescue him. And these men kept coming to him and saying, no, you can't do it. You signed it. You can't do it. We have a law here. And the king gave orders, and Daniel was brought, and he was put into the lion's den. The Bible says, uh, King spoke, said to Daniel, your God, whom you constantly serve, will himself deliver you. A stone was brought, laid over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring. And the king went off to his palace, spent the whole night fasting. And uh, he, he couldn't sleep, the Bible says. He got up early in the morning at dawn, break of day, and he ran to this lion's den. And I love his response when he gets there. He cries out with a troubled voice. And he says, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you constantly serve, been able to deliver you from the lions? Daniel says, yeah, no problem. <laughs> you spoke to the king, king lived forever. My God has, has sent an angel and shut the lions' mouths, and they've not harmed me inasmuch as I was found innocent before him. And also towards you, O king, I've committed no crime. Well, the king knew that. The king knew that. And so the Bible says he, he gave orders. And uh, he brought those men who had maliciously accused Daniel. They cast them, their children, and their wives. That was the Medo-Persian way because they didn't want the wives uh, to rise up and make an insurrection against the king for an un, uh, unpopular decision. So you killed them all. Josephus um, writes in, uh, in some of the early history, and Herodotus also, uh, they write about this, and it's pretty fascinating. But when Daniel was not eaten by the lions, the wise men and the satraps, in order to try to discredit uh, Jehovah's intervention here, actually came and said, well, the problem was the lions were fed ahead of time, and they weren't hungry, and that's why they didn't eat Daniel. And you know what King Darius did? He fed the lions, and then he threw these guys in, and 19 children went in. It's really sad. Nineteen children went in, and the wives went in, and the, the, uh, the, the lions ate everything. <laughs> yeah. All you can eat. Right. Right. So pretty, it, it, it's, it's, it's sad. We reminded God is in control. And it is ultimately, um, truly seeing this take place, it's just a reminder that, again, trusting in the Lord there is, no, there is no harm in, in following the Lord. That's what God wants us to do. Um, your last page there, the control of God, the concern of Darius, um, I just kind of blitzed through that for sake of time here tonight. Oh, I just want to show you here in verse 25, Darius the king wrote to all the people, nations, and men of every language, and he makes a decree. And this is what he says about God. He says, he is the living God and enduring forever, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed and his dominion will be forever. He delivers and rescues and performs signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. Who has also delivered Daniel from the power of the lions? So this Daniel enjoyed success in the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. 
And so uh, a, a pretty amazing chapter of Scripture. Um, I, I find it, again, fascinating that God would take uh, Cyrus the Great and allow Cyrus to give the edict to have the people of, Jerusalem, people of Israel go back to Jerusalem and there rebuild the walls and rebuild the temple, being willing to be able to go back and do those things, and then even give him all of those uh, 5,400 pieces of, uh, of beautiful gold and silver uh, utensils that would go back into the, um, the temple. So it's exciting to see that God is ultimately in control. Keep this in mind, and keep some of these aspects in mind as we get closer towards the end of Daniel. We will be reminded of these truths as we look at the end times, the things that are yet future to us. And so we'll understand a little bit more about the character of God, the, the providence of God, uh, the sustaining power of God. All these things really come through as we get down the road here um, in the subsequent chapters. So next week, chapter 7. Do a little homework for me this week. Would you just read chapter 7 so that uh, you're up on that a little bit uh, when we come together next week? All right. Let's have a word of prayer. I'll let you guys out. I know you've got uh, lots to do here tonight. Father, we thank you. Thank you so much for your word, and we thank you, Father, for the faithfulness of Daniel. Uh, Lord, we, uh, we're reminded uh, that you are holy. We're reminded that you are in control. We're reminded that you cannot be mocked. And Lord, uh, we just pray that we would have the same heart of Daniel, uh, that we would be able to say that uh, our faith is emboldening us to, to live for you today. And as uh, culture uh, makes it more difficult for us, Father, may we, may we hold truly to um, righteousness, Lord, and uh, truly have our eyes on our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. And so we just thank you again for allowing us to study your word tonight. Bless each one, Lord. Just uh, give everybody an awesome rest of the week. And uh, we look forward to worshiping you this Sunday, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.